please pay close attention. The next 30 seconds can make up for all your stock market losses this year and even save your retirement. You'll have a rare chance to hear from two Wall Street legends, Mark Chaikin and Joel Litton. What Mark and Joel are going to share with you may make or break your retirement. A way to 5X your money, even if this market crashes another 20% this year. And they say what's coming before the end of the year will create and destroy fortunes, depending on which side you're on. Let's face it, the stock market's been a minefield this year, with the biggest sell-off we've seen in 50 years. And thanks to inflation, even cash isn't safe anymore. Your money's losing value even as we speak, at a rate we haven't seen since the 1980s. They'll be giving you a financial lifeline that can erase this year's losses for you and trigger a wave of potential wealth that's so powerful it could save your retirement. For a sneak peek of Mark and Joel's big reveal, go to wealthcrisis2022.com. That's wealthcrisis2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's September 27th, 2022. I'd like to say it's a beautiful day down here in Florida, but it's the exact opposite. I think the hurricane's rolling in. It's windy. It's rainy out there. All the windows are closed. I got soaked walking here this morning. But the market's up this week. By the time this comes out, they may be down. However, we've got a big show coming up. We're going to talk about the advanced decline line. You may not know what that is. I'm going to talk to you about that. But I will say it hit a record yesterday. A record. Multi-decade record. We're going to talk about the U.S. dollar surging, what it means for your stocks. Bonds surging, what it means for your portfolio. Then four stocks. I look for stocks that are strong. I found four stocks that look good. We're going to share those with you. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Hello again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 27th of September, 2022. As I mentioned, it's not a beautiful day down here in South Florida. But I will say, if this look any different to you back here, I'm not in Baltimore. I'm in South Florida. My podcast team came down this week. They're still here. They put them in the other room. You know, they're over there in the other room listening to me as I do this. But I got to tell you, folks, I mean, you can't see everything around here. But these two gentlemen did the best job I've ever seen. In a matter of eight hours, they built an entire studio. Look how beautiful it looks. We have more, some more tchotchkes coming behind there that are a little more fun. Uh, but what a great job. Uh, Greg and Will crushed it down here. So uh, grateful to have them down here to do this and grateful to be able to be in front of you in such a beautiful studio and talk about the market here today. As I mentioned, we got a big show coming up. We are going to talk about the market because it's it's something that everybody's it's on everybody's mind right now. It really is. And I go to a dinner, I talk to family on the phone, friends, they ask about the market, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, the market's been going down. The Dow hit a new uh, multi-year low yesterday. The S&P tested it. Uh, the Nasdaq came close to testing their June or um, early at yeah, June lows. And I'll tell you, I talked about this last week. Uh, it's, it, it is a rough time right now. Uh, all that being said, I'm going to talk about some numbers and give you some really historical um, data that might make you feel a bit better. Not today, not tomorrow, but looking at as a long-term investor. So let's take a look at the market here. As, as I mentioned, we were trying to bounce here this morning. The Dow opened up uh, about 300 points off the bat. We're now about, about an hour into trading. The Dow is up 128 points, so it's given back most of its gains. So it's near the low of the session. Uh, the S&P 500, very similar, uh, gapped up, now down closer to the lowest session, but we're still up about 1% on the S&P 500. And the QQQs, which is the NASDAQ 100, about 1.3%, middle of the trading range of the first hour of trading. There's a, lot, there's a lot to do. I will say, folks, we're extremely oversold. And th there was a number that I, that I saw yesterday that, that really kind of grabbed my attention. I don't want to talk about that with you. And that is what they call the 10-day advanced decline line. And that takes the advancers stocks going up and decliners, stocks going down. You take the amount of advancers, you know, minus the decliners. So if there's 4,000 stocks going up, 2,000 going down, the advanced decline line is 2,000. Well, yesterday it hit a negative 2,682, negative 2,682. That's a record low from what I've been keeping these numbers. So let me break this down and give it to you in English what this means. So the breadth, as they call it, um, the underlying strength, if you will, in the last 10 days is the worst in 32 years when I started keeping numbers. So over three decades, 
So it's just saying that many stocks are getting beat up. That's, the, that's, that's what they call the market internals, the market breadth. Um, and again, in plain English, just kind of how it looks under the hood, if you will. So if you're a car person, which clearly I'm not, but if you open up the hood, car could look pristine. But if you open up, like, oh, that doesn't look good in there. That's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing this really ugly breath. Um, the old record was back in August 8th, 2011. Um, and I believe that's when the S&P may have downgraded um, the, uh, the, the, the debt here in the U.S. I, I, I can't remember. It's either that or it was a Chinese thing. Either way, the market sold off about a month back in August of 2011. I looked at what happens a few months after that, because when you have such extreme levels, I like to see how the market performed. So I look back uh, and six months after that. So let's take a look at a chart, because I always like to see performance after such an extreme level as we saw in August 8, 2011. This is the S&P 500 ETF, the Spiders, SPY. Six months after we hit that record low at the time of the advanced decline line, basically showing such negativity under the hood, S&P was up 22% in the next six months. 12 months later, folks. Actually, I take that back. Two years later. I looked at two years later. So 24 months later, the S&P was up 58%. 22 in six months, 58 in two years. Again, history doesn't always repeat itself. But history, the, the, the way that markets are driven, especially when it comes to emotions and this type of underlying under the hood breath that we're seeing in the market is driven by emotions. And right now we are seeing such negativity. I've been telling my team for about two weeks now, my researchers, that I haven't seen negativity like this since really 2008, 2009, uh, really early 2009. You know, Lehman Brothers 2008, Bear Stearns, uh, but the market kept going down into 2009. And again, early March, uh, S&P to intraday low of 666. I was on air that day, Fox Business, never forget it. Uh, I put out the Andrew Jackson portfolio then, uh, several stocks. You can buy one share a piece for under 20 bucks. That portfolio has gone bananas since then. It was just a hypothetical portfolio, so you know. I'm not feeling that, that much negativity yet, but I am because that negativity back then, folks, was more about really financials. It was about, well, Lehman Brothers went out of business. Bear Stearns went out of business. Is the stock market going to be here tomorrow? We don't know. Now the negativity, it's, it's just, it's so broad based um, due to inflation, higher prices. Uh, I will tell you, we had to buy some sound boards or sound panels, we were acoustic panels. You know, they you can't see them behind the camera, but you know, the, the styrofoam the spongy things you put on walls you see in the studios. These things cannot cost more, the box, than two or three dollars to make. The box was over $200. So I see the inflation, I see prices, and it's absolutely bananas to me. So you have that negativity, you have the negativity of people that just hate both sides of uh, the aisle when it comes to politics, you have the war in Ukraine. I mean, I can go on and on. You have the U.S. dollar surging, which is hurting people. The euro, that at 96 cents, I'll talk about that in a second. It's just the negativity goes and goes and goes. And I, 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 I feel in the stock market, selling begets selling. Meaning we start selling and we start convincing ourselves, even if a company continues to increase revenue throughout this whole bear market, Throughout this, let's call it a recession. I guess it's technically not, but it basically is. But we don't see that. The stock's down 50 or 60%. And we'll talk about a couple of stocks in a second. But I just want to tell you that the, the, what I'm feeling right now is very similar to the negativity that we saw back in 08, 09. Of course, I was around in 2000. Uh, I just got into the stock market time working for Charles Schwab out in Colorado. I just don't remember that negative. I, I don't remember it as, as clearly. Uh, I was a bit of a youngin at that point. So before we talk about stocks, there's a few things we must talk about. Uh, one is the U.S. dollar, and I'm going to pull up the UUP, which is an ETF that tracks the U.S. dollar. As you can see here, look at this chart. I mean, you can't find a, probably a better chart anywhere in the market, whether it be commodities or, I mean, maybe yields on bonds, which we're going to look at in a second. But this is UUP. It tracks the U.S. dollar index, uh, which is a basket of um, foreign currencies against the U.S. dollar. As we know, the dollar has been super strong. As we continue to raise rates, it makes it a very attractive uh, for foreign money to come over here because we are paying such high interest rates uh, on our treasuries versus a lot of other countries around the world. So it makes sense to own dollars. And as the Fed remains aggressive, uh, they call it hawkish, uh, we will continue to see the dollar go up in my mind. That being said, folks, 
I mean, you look at his chart, and yes, it's just it's beautiful. It looks like it's due for a pullback. We're down about one tenth of percent today. Let me show you a longer term chart. I mean, keep zooming out here. This goes back to uh, early 07, and it's just it's it's really just taken off from there. So we have seen the dollar really, really explode as of late. And you know what scares me? Not scare me, but what concerns me for people that are rushing into this ETF now, are rushing into the U.S. dollar trade is you go to a lot of different um, financial websites, a lot of different areas right now, and I got to be honest with you, you see, how do I buy the U.S. dollar? This is how you buy the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar is surging. It just seems like you're a little late to the party. So I wouldn't highly recommend running out right now and buying UUP or buying anything that you're trying to take advantage of a strong U.S. dollar. I think a lot of the higher interest rates are priced in, especially next month, or I should say next meeting's 75 basis point hike that's potentially coming from the Fed that's really priced in. That's what the market's telling us. And then 15 December, most likely 25 in February, and then we stop from there. But a lot can happen between them. But I think a lot is priced in the market, so we don't really necessarily see huge upside left on the U.S. dollar. That being said, I just want to put it out there because it has been so dang strong. <clears throat> the other thing I want to look at is um, the, the euro. So the euro broke down to 96 cents. Lucky for me, I'm going uh, over to Europe in about a month, actually, but a little over one month from now uh, for work, uh, for a conference and stuff. And it's going to be, I hate to use this word, cheap. 96 cents. I remember being over there when it was $1.30. So basically paying a 30 cent premium. Now we got about a 4% discount, which is going to be amazing for people going over there. Um, let me show you a chart here. This is the FXE. This tracks the euro. Uh, it's an ETF, the uh, Vesco Currency Shares Euro Trust. You can see here, it's just been straight down. But let me zoom out a bit to kind of show you where we've been. We've really been going down, really, we peaked a long term downtrend in 2008 and been going down this since that time. But you can see in the last year how much has gotten hit. Another currency that's just gotten pounded, and you'll see here in a second, is the British. I don't, honestly, folks, this wasn't planned. The British pounds. I didn't, there, there, there was no pun intended, but now that I, I say it, I, I kind of sound kind of funny, but no pun intended. But you can see here, the British pound really got crushed. Obviously, they have a new uh, prime minister coming in, uh, changed some things, some tax cuts, and it really hurt the pound. Uh, so the pound is now down over 20% year to date. So we are seeing a lot of currencies get absolutely crushed. And obviously, the US dollar has been uh, the light in the tunnel that's actually been doing pretty well. The other thing I need, we need to talk about before we jump into stocks is uh, yields uh, on U.S. Treasuries. The 10-year hit 3.96 this morning, 3.96. Keep in mind that, that it doesn't mean anything to you. The 10-year yield last, about one, exactly one year ago, was 1.3%. Now it's 3.96, 3.96. Let me show you a chart here. You can see here, look at this. Again, I said it was no better looking chart than the UUP. The US dollar is probably the only one that's better looking. And it's up again here today. Um, when it comes to the yields, we have the, the closing on, on basically 4%. We had the two year, the two year, two year treasury. So basically, you loan the US government money for two years. Yesterday it hit 4.35%. What's going to start happening, in my opinion, is when people are out there and are sitting on cash and they'll be more than happy to lock in at 4.35% in a two-year treasury. And that's what we're seeing. However, if there was money rushing in to bonds, the yields have what we call an inverse relationship. So if money's rushing into the two-year tenure, that means more demand for bonds, bond prices go up, the yields go down. I just showed you the chart, the tenure, hitting a multi-year high. So we're not seeing that money rush in as of yet. We're still seeing yields go higher. Jeffrey Gunlock, who is, they call him like the bond king. Uh, every year he's in Barron's, uh, the round table, and he gives his ideas. And I don't know him personally, but he's been wrong so much. And he came out and he said he's been buying bonds recently. He thinks it's a great opportunity to buy bonds. And... Uh, he, this is a quote he came out yesterday. He said, it was brutal to be a bond investor for the past several years, obviously, but now it's actually the place to be and the opportunities are more exciting now than any time in my view in the past 10 years. I just don't, under, I, I, I get it. Like, like he's calling the top in yields, which means it's the bottom in, in bonds. And maybe he's right. 
And, you know, I kind of just talked myself into the trade a moment ago. I, but if the Fed's going to continue to be aggressive, is it the best place to be? I don't know. But keep this in mind. If yields do go down, bond prices go up. So Gunlock is buying bonds right now. He thinks it's a great opportunity. Maybe he's right. I mean, he said he's been buying bonds for a lot. As you can see, the last couple of years have been rough for him as yields have been going up. So I think actually he might be right. And I'm not a big bond guy, but I think there are some opportunities out there right now in corporate bonds. So I mentioned we talked about a couple of stocks. So I think it's important. And in this time, you, I personally, and for my subscribers and for my own money, I, I typically look for beaten down stocks. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. As I said in last week's show and week before that, I think we could go down a little bit lower uh, in the markets. Maybe we caused it. Maybe we had a double bottom. We hit the tested a June low in the last week. Maybe not. Uh, I still think we could have one wave lower and bottom out in October. October is typically a month of crashes, a month of bottoms. And I think we do see that. So again, typically looking for stocks are getting beaten up. But, but what I did today, though, I wanted to look for stocks that were actually holding up pretty strong, what we call relative strength. So here's four I want to take a look at. And they're from very different areas. Um, the first one I take a look at is it's an aggressive company. And it's a battery company. It's a uh, Fryer battery, symbols F-R-E-Y. But as you can see in a chart, that it broke out above this double top around 14 and a half to a new high and since pulled back and consolidating. Very nice skin chart, a very big volume on Fry. Uh, again, symbols F-R-E-Y. $1.6 billion company. Uh, so $1.6 billion company and just getting into the generating revenue. So it's, it's, it's early stage company. This year expected it to generate 5.5 million. So minimal compared to the size. Next year, 41.3 million. So you are seeing huge, huge upside growth. Uh, however, it's still very expensive because it is an early stage company. And as many of you know, one of the keys to buying this type of company is looking for what I call a path to profitability. And I look here and there's no path yet in the near term. So that is a bit of a concern. However, I just mentioned the growth expectations, 5.5 million this year, 41.3 million next year. That's good. That's seven X growth. You know what the estimate folks is for 2024? $830 million. Does it hit that? I don't know. If we come in half of that, you're still 10 X in 2023 to 2024. If it comes in at that level, you're suddenly trading at about two times sales on a company that's growing like that. Don't be wrong. The, the caveat here is, yes, it is not making money yet, but I do believe it will be making money in the next several years as a battery company, as obviously in the name, uh, production of battery cells for a lot of stationary energy uh, storage, also electric vehicles, also for boats. But I like the fact that energy storage, because that is where, you know, as, as big as EVs are going to be, energy storage is extremely important. So this is a company I think you want to look at that has held up very, very well in this type of market. The next one is a completely 180 from where we just were. And I'll show you this chart. This is uh, Academy Sports and Outdoors. ASO is a symbol. Big data up over 6.5%. I can show you the long-term chart here. It's closing in. It kind of tested the all-time high, broke out for a little bit. Just went public back in 2020, right after the uh, um, recession, the pandemic uh, started. And this, this is a company that it's, it's, you know, think of uh, like Dick's Sporting Goods, stuff like that. So it's, it's a sporting goods store, which did very well during COVID because a lot of people were going to sporting goods stores and buying things to play outside and because they were stuck home, really. $3.5 billion company. And what really caught my eye here is uh, how cheap it is based on revenue. This year expected to do $6.7 billion in sales. So trading at a price to sales ratio of this year, uh, about 0.55, 2024, 6.9 billion. So you don't see a lot of growth. 2022, this year, looking for $7.60 a share in earnings. 2024, $7.82. So extremely cheap on every way you look. The one difference, as I said, is it's completely like a 180 from Fry. The one difference is this company is making a ton of money, doesn't have big growth. They had big growth coming in after the... Uh, pandemic hit, but really slowing. That being said, the fundamentals, you look at the, the valuations, the P ratio going forward is 5.8. That's insanely cheap. Price of sales going forward, 0.52. I said 0.55. So based on this year, it's 0.55. But looking ahead next year, 0.52. 
it's it's cheap and people will argue and say matt it's not really growth no it's not growing as much as it was from 2023 to 2024 we're expecting about eight and a half percent top line growth or sorry bottom line growth so it's not huge but again it's so dang cheap it's tough to ignore and people aren't going to start stop going to sporting goods stores so that's one again just giving you ideas of what has really held up and done well the next one is another kind of falls into the uh small cap realm this is sigma lithium corp and again, another great looking chart. SGML is the uh, symbol on this. It just went public back in uh, September of last year, uh, down around eight bucks. It's at 25 now, so 3X or really kind of almost exactly one year uh, uptrend, a higher lows, higher highs, going back to support, great support at 24, 50 day moving average at 22. This is a company again, and, and we all know the lithium story. No revenue yet. Next year is supposed to create revenue for the first time, generate revenue for the first time. And again, there's not a lot of estimates on this, a smaller company, but the estimates for next year is for zero earnings per share right now, obviously, because you don't have revenue, for earnings per share to jump up to $4.71 a share. If that's doable, it trades at 20 times that, let's say, you do the math. You're looking at what, a $95 stock at a 25 today? I'm not seeing it goes there in a year. But again, I'm seeing some crazy opportunities out here because the demand for lithium is not going anywhere because EVs, electric vehicles will continue to rely on lithium ion batteries for the near future. I think we have some new technologies coming in, but it's not anytime soon. So you're going to see them relying up in the near future. We're going to pivot again. One more stock to take a look. And I talked about this one a few weeks ago when we had a guest on and uh, he recommended it. And this is uh, Celsius Holdings, symbol C-E-L-H. I've never drank in this stuff because I don't like energy drinks, uh, but people swear by them. I actually have one in my refrigerator because a friend left it here. I, I don't drink that stuff. I give them coffee even. And it took me 20 minutes at Starbucks today because they forgot to brew my tea. So I'm not this, but, but that kind of guy, but I tell you what, folks, this just hit an all-time high in August, as you can see here. As the, Pepsi owns a large portion, but I think eventually Pepsi buys all of it probably at a much higher price than this, paying a big premium. But Celsius Holdings is, is the kind of company that you just can't ignore. Even though I don't like it, even though I don't get the whole energy drink thing, this is a company that, you know, let's look at the numbers. It's a $6.9 billion company. Uh, revenue last year, $314 million. This year, six nineteen. dollars uh, Next year, nearly a billion. Year to that, $1.26 billion. So you're seeing really nice growth. Not cheap based on that. Um, but what I like really kind of jumps out at me. Earnings per share last year, five cents only, turned profitable on an annual basis. By 2024, looking for like two bucks. So again, do the math. That's like 40X in three years on the bottom line. And again, at $2, trading at $92 a share, you're looking at a company that's trading about 46, uh, four P ratio based on that. And people say it's expensive, but when you're growing from five cents to $2, you're gonna demand a high premium. So that's where we kind of stand right now. I, I think we have a ton of negativity out there. The advanced decline line is the worst we've ever seen. Um, people are telling you to run and buy bonds and, and people are freaking the heck out, to be, to be blunt with you. I just talked about four stocks that I think that look pretty good that are held up, a different way to look at the market. We have the S&P right now up 1.23%, about an hour and 20 minutes in the trading. We have the NASDAQ 100, the more of a tech-based index of 1.5% right now. So we're looking for a bounce. I think we get a bounce. And let me show you this chart. And I'll tell you why. Then we're going to wrap up the show. Here's the QQQs. This is NASDAQ 100. So we call it double bottom. This was a June low. This was low just the last two days, trading days. If we hold this level, we bounce. Pretty, pretty easy. We break this level to new low. The downtrend continues. So again, I think short term we're due for a bounce because we're very oversold. Could we break this? I think the odds are still 50-50. I think we could break it. I think we could break to new lows. Again, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. If my educated guest tells me, probably bottom in, in October, um, probably right before the midterm elections, which is obviously early November. And I think that's going to shake a lot of things up. And I think people will actually like the outcome, regardless of which way it goes. I think people just feel a little more stable, I hope. <laughs> Maybe it's just me being cautiously optimistic, as they say. So... That's where we stand right now. I think short term, we get a bounce. Longer term, we'll see what the market tells us. There are some good stocks out there. I think we'll put money in the stocks, start building positions for long term. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we hit the bottom ready. Maybe we bottom in October, November. I don't know. 
But we'll be here every week, Tuesday, Thursday, to talk about that. Great guests coming up on Thursday. So again, folks, thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a wonderful week. If you're in Florida like myself, please be safe uh, with the hurricane coming, especially if you're on the West Coast. This is my first hurricane, so I'm kind of numb. I don't really know what to do. But I'm going to get some water, some bread, and cheese, because you always make real cheese, right? And I'm good with that. But again, be safe, be happy. Thanks for watching. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.